Welcome to um, our event today, Victoria's Climate Change Future. My name is Dr. Sangeeta Chandrasekharan. I'm the Deputy Director at the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that I stand on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and also to emerging leaders. This is land and waters that have never been ceded and have been cared for for generations and generations. And I would like to pay my respects to the traditional lands that those of you in the audience might be on as well. Um, today, uh, we are talking about the new um, climate change strategy released by the Victorian government. Yesterday, um, the announcement was made that a, a, there is a new 2030 target for reducing emissions by between 45 and 50 percent. Victoria is now moving in step, if not in advance, of major and national and subnational economies like California, for instance. And the statement is accompanied by a whole of government strategy to boost a clean energy economy. This webinar presents an opportunity to explore the strategy, um, both with the um, minister responsible, who I will introduce in a moment, as well as an expert panel, and there will be an opportunity for audience questions at the end. I should mention that this webinar is part of the University of Melbourne series towards 2030, the crucial decade ahead. And this series focuses on actions needed to meet the climate goals by 2030. We're trying to bring experts together through this series to analyze and discuss actions in the lead up to the important international negotiations in Glasgow in November of this year. The recordings of this webinar and previous webinars in the series can be found on our website and the link will, links will be in um, the chat. Um, before I begin, I, I'll, uh, before I do the introductions, I'd just like to explain that both Minister D'Ambrosio and Greg Pombe will um, present to begin with. Um, there will then be a moderated discussion with the panel of experts who I will introduce a bit later. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be audience Q&A at the end. So please place your questions and answers in the Q&A function and our moderators will send them through to me and we'll endeavor to get through as many as we can. I should inform the audience that this session is recorded. Um, so Minister D'Ambrosio will begin by discussing um, the strategy and the targets for about 10 minutes. Uh, the Honorable Lily D'Ambrosio is the current Victorian Government Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change. She's also the Minister for Solar Homes. She has overseen the passage of the Climate Change Act, which is Victoria's, la Victoria's landmark climate change legislation. She's a leading advocate for a modernized energy system and facilitating a smooth transition to a clean, reliable and affordable energy future. Thank you very much, Minister, for making the time. Over to you. Uh, well, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, thank you so much, Sangita, for your welcome uh, and uh, the moderation that you'll be playing here tonight. Uh, and certainly, uh, I want to uh, thank so much the uh, Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne for, for hosting here. Uh, it is a, a terrific opportunity for us to delve a little further into uh, our government's release of our climate change strategy yesterday. But before I do that, of course, my acknowledgement, my acknowledgement must go to the traditional owners of the land on which I am situated at the moment, and that is the land of the Wurundjeri people. And my respects uh, are to all elders past and present and emerging, and any who may be here amongst us today uh, from uh, that traditional owner group or indeed any others. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Greg Combe, the Honourable Greg Combe, who was uh, the chair of the Independent Expert Panel on Interim Emissions Reduction Targets, uh, and fellow panellists, Professor Jacqueline Peel, uh, Melbourne Climate Futures, University of Melbourne, Dunay Bosler, uh, representative of the Victorian Trades Hall Council, and Tenant Reid from the Australian Industry Group. The actions that we take today on climate change are more important than ever. And yesterday, uh, I was very proud uh, to have released Victoria's uh, climate change strategy. The strategy represents a fork in the road for our state and putting forward real ambition, which is what communities expect of us, respecting the goals of the Paris Agreement and embracing the opportunities of a low carbon future. 
Uh, we have always led in Victoria and we uh, are very happy to trumpet that as much as we can. But the reality is that it, it produces terrific opportunities for not just, of course, uh, our environment, but also business opportunities uh, and for uh, the broader community. We were one of the first jurisdictions in the world to legislate a net zero emissions commitment. And we have now set strong targets to cut Victoria's emissions by 28 to 33% by 2025, uh, below 2005 levels, and of course, between 45 and 50% by 2030. These targets reinforce our position as a climate leader, and it provides a strong contribution to the global action required to avoid dangerous climate change. They are well ahead of the targets set by New South Wales and Queensland, and we will see Victoria deliver the most rapid reduction in actual emissions of any major state. International, internationally, these targets are very significant. Uh, and as certainly as Sangita has referred to, uh, as the way I would put it, certainly is that uh, we are standing shoulder to shoulder with the ambition of President Biden and putting us ahead, of course, of international climate leaders, uh, including Germany and California. And of course, uh, our 2030 target is almost double the woefully inadequate one that is set uh, by the Commonwealth government for uh, our country. We'll be delivering the largest cut in absolute emissions of any jurisdiction in the country. And that's something that every Victorian can be proud of. The strategy has been delivered through a set of pledges to cut emissions across the Victorian economy. This isn't just about what we wanna do, but how we're going to do it. And we need to make sure that all of our economy uh, is able to uh, pivot, understand where we want to go as a community and government and uh, work through the steps uh, that each sector uh, has uh, in front of them in terms of opportunities or challenges to be able to contribute to the overall reduction in emissions. Is energy is Victoria's biggest source of emissions. We've invested $1.6 billion in clean energy just in the last budget. That's the largest investment of any state government ever. Uh, that package is already cutting costs for households and businesses. It'll attract an investment and secure a reliable energy supply. And we project that Victoria's 50% renewable energy target will create more than 24,000 jobs. Transport, of course, is Victoria's second biggest source of emissions. And uh, as, as it is globally, it is uh, also increasing. To set a clear pathway to reduce transport emissions, we are setting an ambitious target that 50% of all new cars uh, sold in Victoria uh, need to be zero emissions vehicles by 2030. And to get that started, we're investing $100 million to accelerate the switch to ZEVs. So that investment will go towards, and if I unpack it a little bit, $46 million to provide more than 20,000 subsidies or grants to help Victorians buy zero emissions vehicles. Uh, and that is an Australian first as an incentive. There's a $5 million package for the ZEV Innovation Fund to support greater uptake of ZEV commercial vehicles and $19 million to continue and accelerate the rollout of EV charging infrastructure across the state. By 2025, all new public buses will be zero emissions. To guide this process, we've just released a comprehensive ZEV roadmap and we're appointing an expert panel to look at policy options to meet our goal over the next 10 years. So there's lots of work uh, to be had, but lots of opportunities for uh, a whole range of stakeholders to be engaged and work alongside with us to achieve that goal. We're also making major investments in increasing the amount of carbon in our environment that is stored within our environment. We're spending $77 million to help land managers restore and protect natural landscapes and vegetation through the Nature Restoration for Carbon Storage Initiative. The government is providing almost $20 million to support Victorian farmers to help them take the actions and the action plans that will reduce their carbon emissions, increase awareness of on-farm emissions, and support cutting edge research, innovation and technologies for the agricultural sector. Those action plans will be designed by farmers uh, with assistance of uh, technical experts. There is $15.3 million uh, from the Victorian Carbon Farming Program that will help farmers to plant trees to protect crops and livestock and improve land productivity. So the strategy also shows that the government will lead by example. And this is something that we have committed uh, ourselves to as a government uh, in this area of energy, but also of course the broader climate change agenda. 
We've pledged that the Victorian government operations, that is all of the Victorian government's operations, will be powered by 100% renewable electricity by 2025. And that is the first, we will be the first state in Australia to do that. That includes every public school, every police station, hospital, metro train, trams are already covered off, of course, by a couple of solar projects, but everything else in between, uh, we will be uh, the leader uh, in terms of sourcing our own electricity needs from 100% renewable energy. So our strategy shows the world that uh, Victoria, th that uh, climate action certainly is more than a leadership opportunity. It is something that we can do and must do, uh, and we can also create jobs, grow new industries and leave a safer, healthier environment for our children. We know that there's a lot of work ahead, but my commitment uh, every single day uh, is that we work together uh, we get on with that job and make sure that we take every opportunity available to us to ensure that uh, as we decarbonise our economy, uh, we're taking communities with us and we're increasing the opportunities for business and industry to uh, remain competitive and in fact potentially even get that competitive advantage. We know that first movers get that competitive advantage and we'll shamelessly pursue that uh, every single day. So I look forward to that ongoing engagement and working together to achieve uh, the outcomes that we've set for ourselves. Thank you very much Mr. for that clear introduction. I will ask you some questions in a moment, but um, next we're going to go to the Honourable Greg Combe. Mr. Combe is very well known for his public public roles um, as the leader of the um, ACTU, the National Trade Union Organisation, and as a federal government Labor Minister. He is also, importantly, the chair of the Victorian government's independent expert panel on interim emissions reduction targets. And he's provided very significant advice to the Victorian government um, that has um, informed the climate change strategy. Um, I'm conscious that Mr. Combe has to leave at about 5.40. So um, um, Mr. Combe, you have five minutes to speak and then I'll come back and ask both you and the minister a few questions. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sangeetha, and thank you, minister, and um, welcome to everyone. Hope you find this an in informative session because it's such an important area of policy uh, where I think it's pretty clear in the national context, the Victorian government's showing tremendous amount of leadership. Uh, as has been mentioned, uh, I was privileged to serve as the chair of the uh, panel that has recommended the interim emissions reduction targets for the state economy and we provided, uh, and when I say we, uh, myself and um, Dr. Lorraine Stevenson and Dr. Penny Whitten, who sadly passed away uh, uh, some time ago, but uh, the three of us provided our report to the minister in 2019. Um, and we were charged with several things, just to be clear. One was to recommend these interim targets for the period to 2025 and then the period to 2030 uh, for interim emissions reductions, uh, taking into account, of course, the legislated commitment to achieve net zero in the Victorian economy by 2050. Along with that, we did work to um, recommend indicative trajectories for um, those emissions reductions. We analysed the economic impacts of deeper emissions cut sooner or, or later, past 2030, the economic impacts across the uh, state economy of various emissions reduction scenarios, opportunities to reduce emissions across the state economy, um, potential impacts on regions and, and societies. And we consulted very widely with a lot of stakeholders. And I've only got a few minutes, so I can't spend too much time on that. But the upshot is that with the support of uh, a really talented group within uh, the minister's department, we ultimately recommended emissions reductions targets of 32 to 39 per cent over 2005 levels to be achieved in 2025, and um, 45 to 60 per cent emissions reduction target for uh, the period to 2030. Um, of course, the uh, targets that were announced by the state yesterday in response to those recommendations. I think have been characterised at the lower end of the range. And so there's something that I, of the ranges that we recommended, something I just want to point out because I imagine that it's a, a question that many of you have. I've noticed it in the Q&A already. And we made very clear in making our recommendations that 
for the state economy to be able to um, um, adopt target, targets at the higher end of the ranges that we had put forward, it would require comprehensive national action, that is leadership also at the national level. And just to put that in a little bit of practical context, you know, the Victorian state government can't reform and transform the electricity generation market in the national electricity system um, on its own. Uh, there needs to be a concerted effort if we're to achieve, you know, deep emissions reductions that are required. There needs to be a concerted effort led by the national uh, government by the Morrison government in this circumstance and engaging all of the other states and it's particularly important for those states that are in the national electricity market and so um, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way in which the Victorian government has responded to our report because um, the, the targets I think are strong targets they are achievable targets and they will set the state economy on the pathway to net zero by 2050. And they're not just targets, they are accompanied with a comprehensive set of measures and real financial commitments by the state that will make these targets achievable. At the time that we were considering these issues and looking at the science, it was looking like the 2020 emissions reduction achievement of the state economy would be around 18% over 2005 levels. With the updating of the inventory and a bit of time passing now, um, we're starting in 2020 uh, in the state economy with around a 24, a bit over a 24% reduction over 2005 levels, which means that with these additional um, public policy measures that the state is taking and the targets that are there, they are achievable. And uh, um, so I think it, it's pretty clear evidence that uh, the state government's in a strong leadership role uh, within our national context. Uh, there has been a commitment by Energy Australia, of course, to close your lawn by 2028. And that's yet another really important step along the way in transforming the electricity generation capability in Victoria from brown coal to renewables. And of course, the state renewable energy target is an important player in many of these decisions. So in conclusion, I think all of the measures that have now been announced, the targets that have been announced are a significant contributor to getting the state economy, um, you know, to take advantage of the opportunities and the technologies that are being developed to create the new jobs um, along with emissions reductions. You know, back 10 or 12 years ago when I was responsible for this as climate change minister nationally, it was a bit harder to point to the practical reality that you can achieve continuing economic growth, continuing job creation while you reduce emissions by substantial amounts. The track record, fast forwarding to now, is that you can do it and we are doing it and we can continue to do it. So people should approach this with a great degree of confidence. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Mr. Pombe. I might just ask um, both of you a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned the announced closure of your lawn. So with this um, closure imminent and also with current progress to date that you also discussed, um, it would appear that we're on track to reduce emissions, possibly by up to 40% by 2028. So I guess the question is, how much more could be done in the lead up to 2030 to be consistent with science-based targets and the 1.5 degree pathway? Do you want to pick that up, Lily? Uh, look, I'm happy to, Greg, if you like, and, and thank you, Sangita. Uh, look, uh, certainly I, I understand those projections. We uh, I've always been really clear uh, in the last couple of days about what our targets uh, are about. And if we can achieve more, uh, we will actually achieve more. For, for us, it's about understanding what the opportunities are, are but also un understanding the challenges so that we actually craft 
uh, uh, the most appropriate set of pathways to achieving the reductions uh, that, that we need to achieve to meet uh, our, our goals by 2030. So uh, I am in no doubt that uh, in a number of sectors where significant reductions need to still uh, uh, occur uh, globally, but no less so in Victoria, that uh, we've yet to see the technologies uh, of tomorrow and, and they will evolve. And that's why it is very important that we have also invest in the agriculture sector for research and development uh, in terms of uh, assisting potentially uh, for the uh, looking for those new technologies those new opportunities for us to continue to invest in so but we're going to have to keep monitoring this you know there will continue to be changes in the way that businesses operate decisions that are made in terms of um, energy uh, intensive industries uh, and the way they operate so where we can do more we will certainly have a very clear uh, focus on achieving uh, as much as we possibly can. But again, it's about providing that certainty for investors to come forward. And that's what our targets will do. And our measures will keep building on those measures uh, with every budget and, and every election cycle. The, the uh, state legislation to um, um, sets in train and this, this report and the response of the government is, is part of it, but it sets in train a process where so that 2025 to 2030 period, there'll be further examinations of the state economy on a sector by sector basis by the government um, to look for where technologies are changing, where the emissions reductions can be accelerated. And of course, there'll be consideration of what the 2035 target should be as well. So it's a continuing process as the minister is pointing out. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the um, need for more ambitious national government action that would really help with the coordination of effort. I was wondering whether there are other governance processes that you think would be needed to strive towards um, a 1.5 degrees pathway, um, given that there's you know, issues to do with the governance of the electricity sector in the national electricity market. How could we get better coordination um, through um, whole, whole of government and national um, coordination of governance? Well, <laughs> you, you go, Greg. <laughs> yeah, <it. laughs> um, basically, um, you need a national government that respects climate science and is prepared to act upon it and lead the nation. And now that President Joe Biden has taken the United States into a leadership role globally and announced a 50% emissions reduction target by 2030 for the US um, and all our other major trading partners, the UK, China, the European Union have got um, comparable and, and ambitious targets, interim targets, it is showing Australia up to be a shocking laggard in action um, against global warming and uh, we, we need, I think, to put as much pressure as a community on our national governments, both national political parties, and uh, to show some leadership to make sure that Australia is shouldering its fair share of the burden. And it is a challenging task for Australia as a country because we've been so heavily dependent upon fossil fuel electricity generation. But that just emphasises the need for coherent, um, coordinated action and leadership at a national level to transform our energy generation. And um, I'm afraid the climate wars in Australia are serving our community very badly and we need to get past it. But to do that, we need people in national leadership who at least respect the science and are prepared to act on it. And we don't have that currently. And uh, if I may just add, Sangata, that uh, look, Victoria has always, and myself personally, because I've been the, the energy minister for, for the entire time that uh, the Andrews Labor government has been in power, but uh, I always stand ready to, to be at the table, at the national table, to, to deal with these issues. Uh, now, of course, that, that has not, uh, the outcomes of that have not given us um, the, the responses at a national level that, that, that we all need. Uh, and that is why you're seeing certainly the actions that are being taken very much at a state level uh, evolve in the way that they have. Now, that's not to say that things can't be done far more efficiently uh, and, and, and in a broader uh, 
sense of uh, interest, if you like, if it was done through a national prison. But it's just not available for us. We, we have no choice but to take the steps that we're taking. Uh, but we always do that with a very clear eye on uh, always being ready uh, if, uh, if and when the Commonwealth Government is ready to start talking uh, in a common uh, sense and sensible way about uh, the actions that, uh, that we need to actually tackle climate change. So we stand ready, but we just can't wait. Thanks very much. I've just got one um, last question before we go to the panel for Mr. Combe. Um, I was wondering whether you could reflect on, um, perhaps for the benefit of other governments, on the pros and cons of establishing an in independent panel on targets. What, what works well, but also what are some of the challenges that you faced? Uh, well, I think the courageous thing that the Victorian government did was to um, invite us to form this panel and look independently at the issues and how to get through to net zero at 2050. Legislating that target is a big thing as well. Not a lot of jurisdictions have taken that step, but once you do it, um, it brings a discipline into um, the way in which you think about interim targets in particular and, and your compliance with the goals of the Paris Agreement to hold temperatures to well below two degrees C and to work towards achieving limits to 1.5 degrees C in, in global temperature rises. And um, it means that, of course, you must consider the science carefully, keep politics out of those considerations, um, and uh, look at where you can achieve interim emissions um, reductions, what are the technological changes, you know, just to look at it sensibly and comprehensively. We took the better part of 18 months uh, to do that work and present our report to the state government. Um, and I'd like to think at least that it, it's had some influence in uh, formulating the response, of course. And uh, so I think that's taken a good deal of courage. I think it shows leadership and it's something that other jurisdictions could consider. I now chair an investment um, management vehicle for the industry super funds too. And we've set ourselves a net zero target, for example, for our infrastructure assets like airports and um, toll roads and a heap of other assets that uh, we invest in globally. And that also too leads to a discipline just at a, a particular business level about how you're going to go about achieving it. And uh, so setting the targets has an extremely important role, setting that net zero target by 2050 and then setting the interim targets to get you along the way there. It forces you to consider the technological innovations that you can take, look at an investment case for doing so, and uh, it's, it's, it's just emphasised to me from an investor point of view how critical it is to know from governments where they want to go. And uh, then you can make your investment decisions accordingly, and it gives you a lot of certainty in being able to do so. And for example, wherever you've set a net zero target, a fossil fuel related asset, um, you immediately must start thinking about the lifetime of that asset and how you value it, you know, when you're an investor. It, it changes the equation and, and that's why so many governments and so many stakeholder groups, of course, recognise the importance of it. Thanks very much. It does indeed change the equation. Mr. Combe, thanks for making the time to come and talk to us in a busy schedule, conscious that you have to leave in about 10 minutes. We'll move to the panel now. Um, on the panel, we have Professor Jackie Peel, a professor of law at the University of Melbourne. Um, she's director of the university's new and exciting climate initiative called Melbourne Climate Futures. And she is a world leading expert in the area of environmental and climate law. Uh, we also have Tennant Reid, who manages climate, energy and environment policy at the Australian Industry Group. And he's been um, working there since 2008 um, advising the Leaders Group on Energy and Climate Policy, coordinating research and advocacy, and facilitating the Australian Climate Roundtable and doing um, a number of reports on energy pricing, um, amongst other things. 
Um, last but not least, we also have um, Danae Bosler. Danae is Chief of Staff at the Victorian Trades Hall Council, which is the peak body for unions in Victoria. She's worked in the union movement for 15 years, and she's currently focused on the very important issue of delivering the just transition strategy. And the Minister has also kindly agreed to join us on the panel. So I'll now ask um, each of you a question. Um, and if you could respond for about three minutes, that'll keep us on track if it's time to go to the audience questions. I might start with Professor Peel. Um, in Victoria, the 2030 target was required to be set under legislation. Um, is this kind of legislation common globally? And does it make a difference to have these climate goals in legislation? If so, what is the impact? Thanks, Sangeeth, and thanks for the question, which I think we've already had some allusions to in, in Mr. Combe's comments that, in fact, uh, this kind of legislation is, is fairly rare globally. And in fact, uh, Victoria, in having a Climate Change Act under which these interim targets are, are made, is, is really uh, following best practice in terms of the kind of way it goes about setting these targets. Um, and one of the reasons why it's important to have a legislative process is, as Mr. Conway mentioned, the discipline that brings, but also the transparency for the community of the process of how we set targets going forward and accountability. So under the legislation, there's an obligation that sits on the government to not just make these interim targets, but also to achieve them. Um, and one of the other mechanisms that sits under the Act is a ratcheting mechanism, which just means that there's an obligation to be reviewing the targets on a five yearly basis and to having new, new targets that actually go up in ambition over time. Of course, one of the key questions that we're really probably talking about tonight in this webinar is that of ambition and whether those interim targets that are being set under the legislation, the 2030 target in particular, um, that's being set 45 to 50% reductions by 2030 off, off 2005 levels is ambition, ambitious enough. And there's some questions in the chat I know that go to this aspect of how it relates to the sort of best practice science on the one hand, and we've seen lots of things out in the space recently that have suggested, for example, that Australia's fair share of emissions reductions by uh, 2030 is more around the range of 75% reductions to keep us on track for a 1.5 degree pathway. Um, so there are questions about where we sit in between the, the scientific considerations and then the political context in Australia where we know we don't have ambitious national targets and states are having to take the lead in pushing forward for climate action. Um, that does constrain uh, a little bit what can be done because, of course, it would be better to have a nationally coordinated approach. Thanks very much, Jackie. I'll move to Tennant now. Tennant, what opportunities are presented through the strategy for jobs and also investment growth? And I think some of this has been touched upon, but if you could expand, that would be great. What, what does this target mean for industry? So there are important direct opportunities in the electricity sector transformation around the, the very large scale of investment that will be involved in that, uh, local supplier, uh, construction jobs. On a smaller scale, local participation in the refresh of the, uh, the, the bus fleet um, will have opportunities in it. The bigger opportunity is if we get the energy transition right, the opportunities that we create in energy intensive industries uh, that uh, don't necessarily make stuff for the clean energy industry, but make stuff with what the clean energy industry provides to them. Uh, so aluminium, building materials, basic chemicals, hydrogen, there are lots of tantalising prospects there, but what is critical is that we do get the electricity sector transition right. And uh, one of the factors that clearly the government has, has taken very seriously in this is the time and the preparation that it takes to get big stuff built. Uh, the transmission upgrades, the very large uh, storage assets, the, all the things that need to be done and not just built, but run through regulatory processes and uh, everybody to have their say about them before they're built. It 
it takes a lot of doing. Uh, and so we would, uh, we have quite a bit of confidence based on the amount of work we can see going on, uh, evidenced in the, uh, the strategy, but also in the many, many other work streams going on. We, we have quite a lot of confidence that the, uh, the pace of elect electricity sector change that is uh, envisioned in the strategy can be delivered. Uh, the, the stage managing of the exit of your lawn uh, gives uh, quite a bit of confidence there. Uh, whereas if we were to be um, expecting double the change in half the time, there would be real questions about what we could actually deliver. Uh, beyond that, uh, we do need to look uh, to parts of the um, economy and, and uh, inputs to industry beyond electricity and the transition for the energy services delivered by natural gas today is going to be a very important one. The, the consultation with many different sorts of gas user for whom probably there are equally diverse solutions, different forms of electrification, hydrogen, biogas, there's going to need to be uh, a lot of uh, work done on that transition and we look forward to participating in it with the government. Thanks very much, Tennant. Um, I'm going to go to the Minister now and um, ask whether as part of the development of this strategy you've run an analysis on the welfare impacts of a target like this for vulnerable communities and specific regions. If so, can you tell us a bit more about this and, and let us know what steps the government will take to address some of these issues? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and can I first acknowledge, of course, that um, workers and work, working communities have long been on the front line in the fight against climate change. Workers know firsthand the imp impacts that climate change have, and that's not just um, firefighters and nurses and healthcare workers, that's also teachers in schools. It's our farmers out picking our fruit every day that are on the front line uh, against climate change. And so workers know, and we know, and we've worked with the state government on this as well, that when you position workers front and centre in your decision making about a just transition and what that's going to look like, that's how we get the best possible outcomes in these circumstances. And the state government has, has worked with us on that. And in terms of targeting uh, particular communities, um, when Trades Hall did our own just transition strategy, which I'm working on delivering here now, we wanted to make sure that we didn't isolate and put additional burden onto any sector of workforce, any sector of the economy. Every workforce, every sector of our economy has a contribution to make here. And, and I think you, workers in those unions are really keen to make that contribution as well, from schools to hospitals. But particularly as well, I do acknowledge that our uh, energy uh, producing sectors of our economy as well, and often in the regional areas. So we're talking about uh, Latrobe Valley here, but also down in Portland, Geelong, which Tennant has sort of alluded to, those manufacturing sectors that are dependent upon the energy economy. We need to give them a uh, particular acknowledgement of the supports that they're going to need. And they've worked really closely with the Minister to advocate for that, job transfer schemes and so forth. And I think um, my final point here would be as well, you know, AIG and the union movement may always, may always not see eye to eye, but Tennant and I are on a unity ticket about this. And we've both been on panels for many months, many years now with the Minister, because we recognise and business recognises here that we need to transition and transform our energy sector and that will have wonderful flow on consequences for the manufacturing sector which has long been uh, such a pride in Victoria and will continue to be when we have this energy transformation that we know we need. Thanks very much Danae. Um, Minister, can I just ask you to pick up on that question as well and talk a bit about the analysis that's occurred within your department and where you think the focus needs to be on support of vulnerable communities and affected regions. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and that's, uh, the, that question is at the heart of the actions that we've already invested in, uh, because we understand that, uh, and, I, and I talk as a, a daughter of a, a migrant woman who, whose uh, clothing industry closed down uh, back in the late 80s, so I know what dislocation feels like. Uh, I've, I've, I've witnessed that myself. Uh, and uh, what is really critical here is that government has an opportunity and an obligation to ensure that communities aren't left behind. And that goes to the point of enabling them to also enjoy the opportunities and the benefits of decarbonising our, our system here in Victoria, our economy. Uh, so when you have a look at, our, just 
our, our November budget. You know, we've got significant monies there. A lot of that $1.6 billion is going towards um, helping uh, businesses to have, uh, small businesses in particular, to become more energy efficient, uh, but also households uh, to be able to uh, have greater energy efficiency measures uh, placed in their homes. And it's not just, of course, about the bills, but it's also about their own uh, their own health. Uh, and uh, so the opportunity, and also we're also requiring that with the, the, the large energy projects that we are helping to sponsor, so through our VEDA auctions, having that local content uh, uh, as part of the contracts that are signed, uh, means that we actually start to create the, the um, local supply chains that will hopefully sustain uh, a, a very important uh, jobs, especially across regional Victoria and where dislocation, and we know dislocation when it talks about the energy sector is, is we're primarily talking about the Latrobe Valley region. Uh, so there are terrific opportunities there. So it's about making sure that we have a number of policies in place and support mechanisms to, to ensure that uh, those that perhaps may not necessarily have their own uh, ability to be engaged and take the full opportunities available to them in this transition are actually able to do that, be engaged, uh, get the benefits of that and be part of the solutions. And that's exactly where our policies go. And, and you know, we're, we've got the biggest rollout of solar on on, uh, on people's roofs of any of, of, any of the uh, jurisdictions nationally. Uh, and that's about equipping Victorians to be able to manage their own energy needs uh, in a way that uh, they've never been able to before in terms of clean energy. Thanks very much. Um, we now may go to questions from the audience and there's been a steady stream of um, questions that have come through. And I'm gonna do my best to try and um, group them and ask them as succinctly as possible given time. So the first question um, is for you, Minister. In the absence of strong federal government action, can and will the Victorian government build a coalition of state governments to drive a more coherent national climate policy? And if so, what might that look like? Yes, well, look, uh, I, uh, I'm in um, frequent contact with uh, some of my ministerial colleagues, uh, regardless of their political persuasions, because um, really when you have a look at the state level where traditionally energy has been the responsibility of states up until we went to a national system, not always the case, but generally speaking, uh, we, we find that we, 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 it's reverted to the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we've got the responsibilities to manage uh, this transition. So that we, we share a lot of things in common. And also there's a very strong, broad agreement about, yes, we need to decarbonise. Yes, we need to take strong action on climate change. Now, states will have varying degrees of, of ambition or, or opportunity, in fact, or challenges. Uh, but uh, all of that, uh, I think you, you won't find a state or a, or, or a subnational government that doesn't share in a level of ambition on this front. Now, we will certainly uh, engage where we can. And one of the things that I flagged, and it was in our uh, climate change strategy announced yesterday, is that on the issue of um, vehicle emissions, uh, we have said in that strategy uh, that whilst we'll uh, call on the federal government to to finally make some decisions uh, around uh, improving the emissions of, of vehicles uh, that are imported into our country. Uh, if, if they fail to do that, we are absolutely going to go forward and explore the opportunities that may be available to uh, states to be able to come together and, and, take, and take that as, as um, an opportunity for us to work together uh, in that area. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Sorry, Sangeeta, if I could just come in on the question of national coordination, because it was raised by your question as well. And I think it's a really important one in this context where we're really wanting Australian ambitious action, but we're seeing states leading in this area rather than the national government. Um, and as long, along with Victoria, we've seen strong targets from South Australia, from ACT, from Tasmania. Um, and one contrast that we might uh, make is with the current COVID crisis, uh, where we're seeing a very different process emerging nationally, uh, at least uh, in terms of the national cabinet process and, and states and federal government being able to work more constructively. 
climate change is our, our next big crisis, both in um, an environmental sense, an economic sense, and also in a health context. So maybe there are some lessons that we can learn also from that context about how we build better structures for national coordination so that Australia is, as Mr Combe mentioned, doing its fair share in terms of uh, the heavy lifting on emissions reductions that need to happen to keep us to 1.5 degrees. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And it sounds like a good opportunity for further research and analysis based on our experiences over the last 12 months. I just wanted to pick up on the point made about electric vehicles, because there have been a number of questions about um, electric vehicles and transport planning more broadly. Um, this is a question for Tennant and others feel free to join in afterwards. Do, do you think the strategy is ambitious enough in, in terms of this? And obviously um, the Minister has signalled that there is more work to be done on this. Um, and what would you like to see um, to enhance this and to really facilitate a transition towards um, a decarbonised transport sector? So uh, we're in a strange place here where uh, Australia in general and Victoria in included in that is, is pretty much nowheresville when it comes to electric vehicle uptake worldwide. We are starting from very well behind the pack. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the global automotive industry is clearly moving as well, and many other jurisdictions are. So it's, it's hard to say where we could easily be uh, with just the trends in the global auto sector on their own. Um, it's no secret that uh, AI Group were not fans of the speed of implementation of the proposed distance-based charge. Uh, that the, the government is, uh, is introducing. The package uh, of support for vehicle take up that they announced is, is significant and will make a significant difference. For the next stage, I think that uh, working with other jurisdictions is, is good. We don't have an equivalent to the, the role of California in the US in uh, being uh, ready and able to impose its own vehicle standards. Uh, we, we do have a, a vehicle industry-led scheme uh, that is worth engaging with and, and looking at and seeing what can be done uh, through and around that, uh, that vehicle. Uh, but we also need to look beyond the light vehicle space where the, the, the answer is maybe not here on these shores, but it's, it's clearly in existence overseas. Heavy transport, freight uh, on land, uh, maritime uh, aviation, that's the frontier where there's genuine disagreement about what the best solutions are uh, and uh, helping uh, businesses to test and take up some of those solutions, uh, hydrogen uh, special purpose vehicles, some of the battery electric and hydrogen electric uh, trucks that are starting to enter the market. That's probably the next frontier. Obviously, everybody relates most to what's the car that they're gonna be driving, if they're driving at all, but there's a lot more to transport and our transport emissions than just the car fleet. Thanks very much, Tenet. Did anyone else want to add anything on that? No? Okay. Um, I, I wanted to ask, um, I, I'll just ask this as an open question. Um, the, and Danae, you may have some specific um, perspectives, particularly from the employment and economic opportunities angle. Um, traditional owners um, of land can how could they be better empowered to get a foothold in clean energy industries um, and, and and ensure that their their rights are upheld fantastic thank you for the question and i think um uh, there was a, a point that i missed out earlier that i wanted to make now which fits in with exactly what you said which is as we transform the uh, our energy sector as we transform our economy for a clean economy, this is actually an opportunity to rebuild what our workforce looks like. So for example, uh, it's, it's semi-related, we have one of the most gender segregated workforces of the OECD nations. So how do we 
and I don't think these two things are mutually exclusive. I think they overlap. Our lagging position on um, action on climate change overlaps with this as well. So how do we make sure that our First Nations brothers and sisters have better access to the jobs that we're creating right now? How do we make sure that young sisters and older sisters have more access to the jobs that we're creating right now? And I think, and um, Trey Tall is really upfront and open about this, is that there needs to be government intervention. We've long held a position, and that's why we're really supportive of the action that the state government is taking, is we can't just leave this to the market. You know, we know when we do leave to the market, it goes really badly for workers. Workers lose their jobs and communities are left uh, at, in rubble. So we know we need to have a government intervention. And some of the really good examples of this we can look to is what state government's doing in other areas in the massive big bill that's happening right now, where there's commitments and targets there for First Nations people to have access to jobs and for women and for young people and for people coming out of the prison system to have access to good union jobs on government sites that are long running projects. So this is a real opportunity that we can um, build a better workforce for us. And, uh, and I'll get it in here now because I know it needs to be said, we've talked about the absolute lack of leadership at a federal level. And this also aligns when it comes to industrial relations. Our federal government continues to attack workers and unions. And so how are workers going to be able to have a say in what's happening in their workplace as we go through a transition uh, if, if we're so limited in, in what workers are, are safe to say in their workplaces because it's suppressed by our federal government. So these two things are, uh, are all run side by side um, and, and, I'll, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mayor Minister. Did you want to add anything to that? Oh, look, uh, only that uh, certainly we, we've um, uh, made some early steps towards uh, assisting uh, traditional owners and certainly as, as the Environment Minister, there's a, a really important intersect in terms of public land and of course traditional owner identity, cultural heritage, ownership, uh, all of those critical questions and, and in terms of how that, that relationship can actually be turned also into an opportunity for them to be part of a, you know, um, a, a decarbonising, a decarbonised economy uh, that works for them. And so we've made some early investments uh, to assist them in some renewable energy uh, mapping and projects. Uh, early days, but it's one that uh, we're absolutely committed to and we're already engaging with traditional owner groups about you know, what, what do traditional owner rights look like on public land? How, how does that give effect, enable them to give effect to what they're desires and aspirations are uh, for their peoples uh, and how do we assist them in developing up um, capacity opportunities. So they must be an integral part of us uh, decarbonising our economy so that we actually uh, rightfully present them with the full opportunities that they deserve. Thank you. Really important points about um, the climate justice aspect of this transition. Um, we've probably just got time for one more question. Um, I will give this to you the minute, to the minister, but um, I, others on the panel, pl please feel free to, um, to answer it as well. When do you expect Victoria's power grid will no longer require coal-fired generation? And what's the biggest barrier to this happening sooner? <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm not sure if that's a, an openly... Um... A trick question, but uh, but look, um, I, I think what we need to do, and I know there's been quite a lot of conversation about, you know, um, are anyone's targets based on what the science is telling us we need, or is it politics? But but I also want to throw in a third element here of consideration is that physically, how quickly can we do a whole bunch of things that need to happen, like in a physical sense? So. People did point out, and I think maybe Greg may have mentioned this earlier, or, or, or someone did, uh, about the grid constraints. And, and we, as a government, we're putting in the largest investment in grid upgrades because we can certainly go full steam ahead and, and build as much uh, renewable energy generation, renewable electricity generation as we could possibly put in the system. But if we can't move it from A to B and then Z, um, it, 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 it just doesn't work. So the physical constraints are really, they are real. And people can say, well, why, were, why wasn't this planned 10 years ago? And I'll say, yep, that's right. Why, weren't, why wasn't it planned 10 years ago? Uh, but what I'll say to you is that we just had a system at a national level, uh, which really didn't anticipate the rapid move towards where we are right now. And I remember sitting uh, and hearing a lot of old stories that, that are not so old in, in, in a real sense of time but in terms of what we're facing. But, but uh, it caused, caught a lot of people by surprise, but we should have had institutions at a national level that 
really understood where it was going, but also proactively seek out um, uh, a, a, a template, if you like, uh, to enable and facilitate, um, a, you know, a, a, a smoother way of, of getting new generation built. So, uh, as so, if if tomorrow we were to have, if if, if for example, Lo Yang A and Lo Yang B turned around and said, "We're out of here next year," would we survive? The answer is no. Uh, people would not be able to have power. That's the reality of it. Uh, so, so we need to be cognizant of that when we talk about what does just transition mean. For some people, they say, oh, 12 months. But you now, what's magical about 12 months? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound like it's a sensible part of a, a coherent plan that will get us to where we need to, taking communities with us, but at the same time, act in that sense of urgency in terms of what we need to achieve to, in terms of decarbonising our energy system. But Tennant did met, talk very squarely about, um, I think with the, the electricity system, the technology is there. It's really, it's about the physicality of things and how quickly we can move, but also making sure that the, it's smooth, okay? For a lot of economic reasons, uh, localised dislocation, all those things, and enabling uh, the, the grid to be developed up. In terms of gas, that is the next horizon. That's the next big challenge. Uh, of, of, and and uh, I, I would, I think we'd probably agree, Tenant, I'm not sure, but I, I would imagine that uh, we could at least agree that we're nowhere near a maturity of understanding of technology that will autom or, uh, seamlessly replace what we've got at the moment. That's not to say people aren't peddling really fast. They are peddling really fast. The technologies are there. Obviously, there's a cost curve here. There's the protect production side of it. Uh, and uh, and all of those things got to stack up. But if if it's any if the electricity sector is any indication of how rapidly we can come up with the solutions uh, that are viable, then I, I reckon that we could probably expect that the gas question um, is one that uh, would probably surprise a lot of people in terms of how quickly that could very much come round. Thank you. And Jackie might also want to add about the institutional, the regulatory challenges that are very material in all of this. So, um, Jackie, you've got about one minute. Yeah, I was actually going to, Tenant put his hand up before. So if you want to take the floor, Tenant, and then I was just going to make a final comment um, on some of the other aspects that we haven't considered, Sangeetha. Well, I'll just say that to, to replace uh, the big assets in our electricity system and to do all the other things that we are going to need to do to make the whole transition, we're going to need to build big stuff and lots of stuff. Uh, and that not everybody is going to like every one of those projects because of where they are or what they are. And we need uh, the challenge is to listen to people and treat them fairly but get big stuff done. And that's going to be Thanks. difficult for all of us. Thanks, Terry. Um, Jackie. I'll... Uh, and I think ambition is something that we can all agree is, is needed and very welcome. But I just wanted to mention that there's a whole lot in this plan that is something that we really need to digest and think about over time. In the chat, there's a question about adaptation. And I note in the plan, the, the government talks about every dollar spent on adaptation now, avoiding future costs of six times as much. That sounds like a pretty good business case for action to me. Um, and there are lots of aspects around forestry, around agriculture, that really need a lot of scrutiny. I think a lot of help and, and research and really looking forward to pursuing more um, discussions and conversations on these issues as we take um, Victoria's climate future forward. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm going to call the panel to a close because we've almost run out of time. Um, Professor Don Henry, who's based at my institute um, and is the Enterprise Professor of Environmentalism, is going to finish with some closing comments. Thanks, Don. Sangeetha, thanks so much, and Minister and fellow panellists uh, and everyone on the site. G'day. Um, Victoria's new, the 2030 target that's there, Minister, aligns strongly with President Biden's uh, doubling of the US effort uh, just uh, recently. And you've also got a whole of government strategy that we've all been discussing on the panel uh, for its implementation. There's no doubt for Victoria and indeed for the US, more is going to need to be done to track in towards 
the striving for 1.5 degrees that we need. But this is a very substantial commitment and a very substantial uh, strategy. Uh, I think it's an important contribution, by the way, towards the effort that all countries have been asked to bring into the Glasgow COP at the end of this year. And it's worth noting that uh, state governments can submit their commitments and action into the Glasgow COP. So we build uh, knowledge, uh, encouragement uh, and momentum at that COP. And there's a role for the state governments to play. I've picked up some really important opportunities and challenges from this discussion uh, tonight. Um, you know, for example, can other states be encouraged to do more? And Minister, you were talking about the opportunity for collaboration, at least around electric vehicles, then there may be uh, there may be more there. The importance for looking for opportunities to scale up action. There's also been careful thoughts that the timing of scaling up is really important to look after communities, disadvantaged uh, regions. There's opportunities and challenges sitting across the sectors. You have pledges in there across energy, transport, uh, for farms and forests, uh, cities and towns, and the issue of resilience or adaptation uh, that Jackie uh, brought forward. Uh, there's been some discussion, excuse me one sec. I had to turn the lights on, um, hopefully renewable. Uh, <laughs> there's been some discussion around the opportunities this unlocks for a clean economy, uh, for jobs, um, and a, a note on that, on the importance with traditional owners as well being in that equation. There's been discussion about the challenges and opportunities around transition with Latrobe Valley and other places and other sectors uh, uh, across our society. And seeing how a whole of government approach uh, tracks and the strengths and weaknesses of that and how it can be improved over time will be a great challenge and a great learning, not only here in Australia, but around uh, the world. Uh, Victoria is about 25% of the Australian economy, and there's no doubt that this substantial commitment and strategy um, can give even more certainty that at a national level in Australia, that we can meet ambitious 2030 targets and net zero by 2050. Thanks so much, Sandeetha. Thanks very much, John, for those um, concise closing comments. And we are out of time and indeed over time, so my apologies for that. I just want to thank um, all of the panelists, Minister D'Ambrosio, Mr. Combe, Professor Peel, Danae Bursler, Tennant Reed, and John Henry for your excellent participation. I want to thank the audience for the great questions that have come through. I'm sorry we couldn't address them all. And a special thanks to my team at MSSI, particularly Claire Denby, for pulling this together under um, quite short notice. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. And this will be available on our webinar if you'd like to revisit it. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.